Hold on. Hold Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Riley. I'm the director and chief curator here at America's National Churchill Museum at Westminster College. Uh, I'm very pleased that so many of you have joined us today as we honor and recognize those who participated in and served in World War II, uh, particularly those who were a part of the greatest invasion in the history of mankind that happened 75 years ago today, June 6th, 1944, D-Day. I'd like to welcome to the podium Chaplain Lieutenant Colonel Patrick Moore to offer an invocation and a prayer. Thank you for the honor of letting me be here today. I'm going to offer an invocation and then I'm going to read uh, the prayer that President Roosevelt shared with the country on this day 75 years ago. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we gather to remember this longest day. Send your spirit upon us that we might not gather in vain. For if we gather merely for an historical day on a calendar, we gather in vain. If we gather thinking the lessons from the past do not apply in this postmodern age, we gather in vain. If we gather thinking of romantic and Hollywood images of military service, we gather in vain. But rather, let us hear hard truth in the words of Ernie Pyle, who said on that longest day, mile on mile are soldiers' packs. Here are socks and shoe polish sewing kits and diaries, Bibles and hand grenades. Here are the latest letters from home, snapshots of families back home staring up at you from the sand. Oh God, let us not gather in vain, but to remember real people, men, boys, really, sacrifice for the cause of freedom, costly freedom. And yet on that longest day, freedom was far from their minds but rather the true sacrifice was laying down their life for their buddy, for their fire team, for their platoon, for the other. Jesus said no one has greater love than to lay down their life for the other. So may this service make us remember to love, even in the battle for freedom. It's in thy name we pray, amen. And now I'll offer the prayer that President Roosevelt shared with the nation. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard, for the enemy is strong. 
He may hurl back our forces. Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again. And we know that by thy grace and by thy righteousness of our cause, our sons will triumph. They will be sore tried by day and night, without rest until victory is won. The darkness will be rent by noise and flame. Men's souls will be shaken with the violences of war. For these men are lately drawn from their ways of peace. They fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They fight to let justice arise and tolerance and goodwill among all thy people. They yearn but for the end of battle, for their return to the haven of home. And for us at home, fathers and mothers, children, wives, sisters and brothers of brave men overseas whose thoughts and prayers are ever with them, help us, almighty God, to rededicate ourselves in renewed faith in thee in this hour of great sacrifice. Many people have urged that I call the nation into a single day of special prayer, but because the road is long and the desire is great, I ask that our people devote themselves in a continuance of prayer as we rise to each new day and give, and again, when each day is spent, let the words of prayer be on our lips, invoking thy help to our efforts. With thy blessing, we shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemy. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed and racial arrogancy. Lead us into the saving of our country and with our sister nations into a world unity that will spell a sure peace, a peace invulnerable to the schemings of unworthy men, and a peace that will let all men live in freedom reaping the just rewards of their honest toil. Thy will be done, almighty God. Amen. It's my privilege to read to you today the message to the soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force from General Dwight Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940 and 41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats in open battle, man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together in victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessings of Almighty God upon this great and noble 
undertaking. This is a letter written by Captain George Montgomery of the 82nd Airborne to his fiancée on June 25th. Arlene, my dearest, today is our 20th day in action, yet it seems like years. What has happened to me and my battalion would be scoffed at, even in a 10-cent novel, as being impossible. Why the few of us left are alive is something to figure out in church. I just can't believe it is all really happening. I never in my wildest dreams knew such terror could drip, grip your very soul. The business of landing deep in enemy territory and trying to hold a position, assaulted and shelled from four sides until friendly troops break through, is something I hope they never ask me to do again. The night we jumped, D-Day plus six hours, was the payoff night. The Jerry's knew our plans down to the last detail and were waiting for us with everything they had. My chute was on fire from tracer bullets when I landed, right in front of a machine gun emplacement. I cut out of my harness and crawled for a couple of hours with bullets whistling past my ears, coming from seemingly every direction. I can tell, can't tell you what else went on, but the story gets good from here. I hope it won't be too long before I can tell you personally all that has happened. Anyway, God alone br brought me safely through this far, of that I am sure. My darling, I love you more than life itself. I've realized that many times these last three weeks when I thought I was going to be killed and always the regret of missing seeing you and marrying you was topmost in my mind at the time. I think I can say my love for you has been pretty well tested. Goodbye for a while, George. I'm humbled and honored that Westminster College, my alma mater, President Lampkin and Tim Riley asked me to present the speech by the Prime Minister. I do this in honor of my late uncle, uh, Walter Dane, who was a D-Day plus 20, fought in the Battle of the Bulge and helped liberate Dachau. The Prime Minister. I promise to report to the House later on in the sitting. I have been at the centers where the latest information is received. And I can state to the House that this operation is proceeding per thoroughly satisfactory manner. Many dangers and difficulties which at this time last night appeared extremely formidable are behind us. The passage of the sea has been made with far less loss than we apprehended. The resistance of the batteries has been greatly weakened by the bombing of the Allied Air Forces, and the superior bombardment of our ships quickly reduced their fire to dimensions which did not affect the problem. The landing of the troops on a broad front, both British and American allied troops. I will not give a list of all the different nationalities they represent or the states they represent, but the landings along the whole front have been effective and our troops have penetrated, in some cases, several miles inland. Lodgements exist on a broad front. General Eisenhower's courage is equal to all the necessary decisions that have been taken in these extremely difficult and uncontrollable matters. The airborne troops are well established 
and the landings and the follow-ups are all proceeding with much less loss, very much less than we expected. Fighting is proceeding at various points. We have captured various bridges which were of importance and which were not blown up. There is even fighting proceeding in the town of Cannes, inland. But all of this, although very valuable first step, a vital and essential first step, gives no indication of what may be the course of the battle in the next days and weeks. Because the enemy will now probably endeavor to concentrate on this area. And in that event, heavy fighting will soon begin and will continue without end. As we can push troops in and he can bring other troops up, it is therefore a most serious time that we enter upon. Thank God we enter upon it with our great allies, all in good heart and all in good friendship. 6 June 1944, Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill, the Prime Minister, to the House of Commons. Two days later, he spoke briefly to the House and said, I will not talk about the battles raging now, but I want the MPs to go to their constituents and lift the morale of the people because it will be very difficult and we can't be over optimistic for the end result. Good morning, I'm Brock Ayers, alumnus of the college, uh, Churchill Fellow, trustee, and retired Army Major. I present today a resolution from the Association of Churchill Fellows uh, to, the, to the group here today. Whereas during World War II, more than 16 million Americans served in the United States Armed Forces with 405, 399 killed in action and more than 671,000 wounded, and whereas 130,200 American forces were captured by enemy forces and served as prisoners of war, of whom 16,129 returned home after the war, and whereas, as a turning point in World War II, was Operation Overlord, planned by Allied leaders President Franklin D. Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Winston S. Churchill, which was carried out on June 6, 1944, on five beaches codenamed Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juneau, Sword, along the coastline of Normandy, France, and whereas the invasion of Normandy combined the Allied ground forces of nearly 160,000 American, British, and Canadian troops as well as 2,395 aircraft, 867 gliders, 6,939 ships and landing vessels into the largest amphibious invasion in military history. And whereas during the D-Day campaign, which began June 6th and lasted through August 21st, 1944, the Allies landed more than two million men in northern France and suffered more than 226,000 casualties, including nearly 73,000 killed or missing in action and 153,475 wounded, while German losses included more than 240,000 casualties and 200,000 captured. And whereas D-Day marked a decisive turning point in the war, as Paris was liberated within two months and less than a year later, on May 7, 1945, Germany signed an unconditional surrender, changing the course of history, and whereas, as the United States of America, Great Britain, and all democratic nations today are indebted to the courageous men and women who served and fought during World War II, 
to preserve liberty and freedom for all, including four outstanding representatives of America's greatest generation. And today, whereas Morton E. Harris, a highly decorated representative of those allied forces, having successfully completed more than 33 combat missions over occupied Europe, having been shot down by enemy fire twice, having successfully delivered arms to French freedom fighters who fought in support of the Allied troops, having struck coastal defenses and communications networks, flying early morning sorties during D-Day invasion of Normandy to attack German troops holding Khan France, having been commander of the 334th Squadron of the 95th Bomber Wing of the 8th Air Force, and having flown the mission that first reached Berlin. And whereas, James Dale Jim Felt Sr., also a highly decorated representative of those Allied forces, having served in the U.S. Navy aboard the USS Plunkett, assisting convoys in the North Atlantic, having participated in the invasion of North Africa and the Axis boot of Sicily and the Battle of Anzio, and screened the transports off Omaha Beach on D-Day, and aided in the shore bombardment at Cherbourg, France, and later landing in Japan with the first occupation troops. And whereas Claude Bauer Friend, a highly decorated Purple Heart recipient who served in the U.S. Army as a member of the 23rd Regiment, 2nd Infantry Division, Heavy Weapons Company Hotel, was sent to Normandy Beach as one of the first invasion forces on June 6, 1944, who fought their way across France through the summer and fall crossed into Belgium and courageously fought the Battle of the Bulge in December 1944 and January 1945, the last major German offensive on the Western Front during World War II. And whereas Richard Toshio Dick Hemney, a highly decorated officer who went to officer candidate school at Fort Benning, Georgia, commanded 50 GIs who escorted 1,400 German POWs back to Germany on a ship by, and by train, and was assigned as a member of the General Dwight D. Eisenhower's division to Karlsruhe in Munich, where he was responsible for guarding trains and railroad yards in the southern part of Germany and Austria, and guarded shipments into Switzerland and Italy. Therefore, be it resolved that we, the Board of Governors of the Association of Churchill Fellows at America's National Churchill Museum, do hereby convey our deepest respect, admiration, and profound gratitude to these veterans and all courageous men and women who fought in World War II to preserve the liberty, freedom for all Americans and our allies around the world. Furthermore, we, the Board of Governors, are especially thankful for those GIs who risked their lives and for those who made the ultimate sacrifice on the beaches of Normandy to liberate France and the rest of Europe during D-Day operations, which began 75 years ago on the sixth day of June, 1944. Good morning. I'm a general retired Frank Grass, a uh, kid that grew up in Missouri and headed off to the military, uh, sort of 47 years, and uh, it's great to be back in the Midwest here, uh, especially on this day where we can remember those who have served, those who were there that day on D-Day, and we can never forget their sacrifice because this world would be a different place if we didn't. Uh, President Lampton, Sir, thank you and your staff, uh, for Tim Riley, the whole team here, uh, the Board of Directors and Board of uh, Governors, for their support for this uh, today. It is so important that we, we take time, and especially for the young children here today, that they remember what happened and why, so that we never have to repeat it again. My task today is to issue a proclamation for Captain Mort Morton Harris and I'll read a little bit about him and then I'll issue the proclamation. Captain Morton, Mort Harris, entered into active service in March of 1943 at the age of 23. 
He was assigned to the 95th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force, where he served as the lead combat pilot and squadron commander. His squadron, the 334th, was equipped with Boeing B-17s. Flying fortresses, Captain Harris completed a total of 33 missions. On June 6th, during the D-Day invasion of Normandy, he fought around the clock in support of Allied troops, striking coastal defenses, communications networks, and enemy forces. The following is one of his memories of D-Day. On D-Day 1944, my crew and I were obligated to take two separate plane loads of bombs to the target area. In doing so, our top turret gunner was wounded and bleeding. We also had an extremely difficult time on our return to the United Kingdom in that we had been struck in the IFF, which is the identification of friend and foe device on the aircraft, which was now out of commission. We were not permitted to return until the IFF people prepared and cleared us for re-entry into the United Kingdom, which took about 45 minutes of perilous time hovering in a circle, waiting for clearance with our wounded gunner on board and in need of urgent military care. Today, in recognition of Captain Harris's tremendous service, I am honored to publish the proclamation. Whereas both the Church of St. Mary the Virgin, Alderman Berry in Fulton, Missouri, and the museum in its undercroft form, America's National Churchill Museum, the only organization recognized by the United States Congress as America's permanent tribute to Sir Winston Churchill, and whereas former President Harry S. Truman invited former British Prime Minister Winston S. Churchill to give his now Sinew of Peace Iron Curtain speech on March 5, 1946 at Westminster College, located in Truman's home state of Missouri, and whereas the church, which has endured several devastating catastrophes, including aerial bombing during World War I and the Blitz of London at the start of World War II, continues to survive and attract thousands of visitors to its home in America's heartland. And whereas the church and museum exist on the campus of Westminster College only because of the Allied victory in World War II, a victory that was the result of the sacrifice, skill, and courage of the servicemen and women of the United States, Great Britain, and their allies. And whereas Morton E. Harris is a representative of those allied forces, have success, having successfully completed more than 33 combat missions over occupied Europe, having been shot down by the enemy, twice, having successfully delivered arms to French freedom fighters who fought in support of the Allied troops, having struck coastal defenses, communication networks, and early morning sorties during the D-Day invasion of Normandy to attack the German holding of Caen, France, and having been commander of the 334 Squadron of the 95th Bomber Group of the 8th Air Force and flying the first Berlin mission. Whereas Mr. Harris's post-war life has been filled with business success as well as public service, he has become a leading philanthropist in the fields of education, health, and other causes. And whereas America's National Churchill Museum had a grand celebration of the 50th anniversary of the rededication of the Church of St. Mary the Virgin Alderman Berry in Fulton, Missouri on, the, on May 5th, 3rd to the 5th, 2019, a celebration that was enriched 
by the presence of Mr. Harris, who brought special meaning to the event and was recognized in standing ovations from all assembled, including in response to remarks from the gala's keynote speaker, Mr. David Rubenstein. And whereas Mr. Harris has been a proud supporter of the America's National Churchill Museum, having been named a Churchill Fellow in 2018, and having captured the spirit of Churchill with his remarks at that time. And I quote, I am honored to be named a Churchill Fellow. World War II was about a relentless fight for freedom against a well-armed enemy. At the onset, a successful outcome was uncertain. Churchill's voice gave us hope. His courage was contagious, end quote. And whereas, during his unit and our Crosby Kemper lecture in 2018 at Westminster College by Israeli Ambassador to the United States, Ron Dermer, he singled out Mr. Harris with due praise, and I quote, I want to congratulate my fellow fellows, especially Captain Morton Harris, a pilot in the Second World War, who is now 97 years young. Captain Harris, after reading your biography, 33 missions, a record eight bombing raids over Berlin, twice shot down. I could not help but think how proud Churchill would be to have been here personally to honor you today." End quote. And whereas June 6, 2019 is the anniversary of D-Day, the 75th, and will be recognized at the church with a special a service of remembrance for those who served in the Allied liberation of Europe including those who lost their lives and those who returned home, like Mr. Harris, to have lives of great service and significance. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Governors of the Association of Fellows at America's National Churchill Museum, Fulton, Missouri, do hereby proclaim June 6, 2019 to be Morton E. Mort Harris Day at the Nat America's National Churchill Museum. I was called up to read the poem, I Must Return, by Sergeant Frank J. Warinovic. I must go back to Normandy to look out upon the sea, where once a great armada, <coughs> where once a great armada carried troops including me. I must go back to Omaha to walk along the shore and let my mind go back in time to when there was a war. When I go back, I'll know I'll mourn and shed some tears and feel the pain. But I must go back and reminisce and think and pray for those who there remain. For they too were out upon that sea, and when they died in Normandy, now from their graves above the shore, they'll keep their watch out on that sea forevermore. I must go back to Normandy and with them once more look out upon that sea. Thank you, Kai. And thank you all who have shared with you your words and the words of others from June 6, 1944, and at other important times in our nation's history. History is why we are all here. There are those of you here who lived it, there are those of you here who made it. And for that, we are grateful. What happened 75 years ago in Normandy, in Europe, and in the Pacific Theater 
changed the course of the rest of the 20th century, and the impact of what happened that day is still felt today. As someone mentioned earlier, shortly after VE Day, that great day in May of 1945, almost a year after D-Day, when Europe was liberated, uh, Winston Churchill saluted his countrymen. And he said, this is your victory. He inspired a nation throughout the war and in its victory. What we forget is that less than two months later, there was a general election in Europe, and Churchill, having won the war, lost an election. He was despondent. He was down. His wife tried to console him. His wife, Clementine, said, Winston, I think this is a blessing in disguise, to which Winston said, it's very well disguised. <laughs> but Winston Churchill, like so many of those who fought so bravely 75 years ago, was not one to be knocked down easily. And he always got back up. In fact, shortly after his loss to the election, he received an invitation from Westminster College President Frank McClure, inviting him to come to Fulton, Missouri, in America's heartland, to give a speech. And with Hen Harry Truman at his side, President Truman, Churchill gave here on March 5, 1946, a speech called The Sinews of Peace. We now refer to it as the Iron Curtain speech. And in that speech, Churchill reflected upon what happened in World War II. He said, last time I warned of the oncoming of the war, and no one would listen. He said, if people had listened, we could have won the war without firing a single shot. But no one would listen. Then, here at Westminster College in Fulton, he gave a warning that said, we must learn from history. And again, said the next threat is the Soviet Union. The first shot in the Cold War, or non-shot as the case may be, happened here at Westminster College. Churchill knew history, he celebrated history, he learned from history, he inspired those to learn about history. And as we salute, these brave men who are with us today, and we honor them for their participation in history, for fighting so valiantly to ensure our freedoms today. We remember history. Here at America's National Churchill Museum at Westminster College, however, we do not only celebrate history today. We do it every day. And I'm so pleased to see so many young people with us. The greatest generation that's with us today have done so many th things. The next generation has to pick up the ball and carry it forward. And commemorations like the one we have here today in this hallowed space are reminders of our obligation to carry history forward, to learn from it, not to repeat our mistakes, to be informed and inspired by those of us who came, by those who came before us, and leave a legacy for those who will come after us. So once again, I thank you all. I particularly salute uh, the World War II veterans who have come with, come, come with us. Thank you for your service, your continued service, your inspiration, and for being with us today. I'd like now to invite the color guard to close the ceremony.
thank you once again. I invite you all to visit the museum, to come up, meet some of our guest speakers, and enjoy this day, and take history forward with you wherever you go. Thank you again.